Good morning, Russ Dietrich. Good morning to you, James, and all the folks out there. Russ, as you know, I had the pleasure of doing Wednesday's broadcast from the uh, Robert Jackson Center. Part of history, Jim. Part of history. And we have, thanks to you, have put together here the comments made at that uh, affair, that historic moment in our community. And we thought the audience that did not get an opportunity to be there mm -hmm. or here would uh, enjoy the opportunity today to look back and hear the prosecutors that served with Robert Jackson at the Nuremberg trial. They had a full house that morning, didn't they? Yeah. It was great. Standing room only. Standing room only. I feel, thanks to you, Russ, that the appropriate way to start this broadcast is to read because it deals with the Nuremberg trial and its moment in history what Robert Jackson said when he opened the trial. May it please your honors, the privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. That four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. This tribunal, while it is novel and experimental, is not the product of abstract speculations, nor is it created to vindicate legalistic theories. This inquest represents the practical effort of four of the most mighty nations of the world, with support of 17 more, to utilize international law to meet the greatest menace of our times, aggressive war. The common sense of mankind demands that law shall not stop with the punishment of petty crimes by little people. It must also reach men who possess themselves of great power and make deliberate and concerted use of it to set in motion evils which leave no home in the world untouched. It is a cause of this magnitude that the United Nations will lay before your honors. It is an historic day in Jamestown. Let me say this is the story of a country lawyer in an international court. I just want to read, uh, I just want to read to you. I've got Greg Peterson with me. I just want to read Mr. Justice Jackson, or Bob Jackson, as he was affectionately called, was a country lawyer and was proud to be so named. But destiny called him to the larger life and the larger world and the country lawyer became the member of the Supreme Court and the world figure of international trial at Nuremberg. Greg Peterson, to you and to the committee, anybody responsible for this day, you're to be congratulated. Well, thank you. I think it's going to be an extraordinary event, uh, really about an extraordinary man, and brought to us by uh, the memory from the memories of extraordinary people. I look forward to uh, spending time this morning with the Nuremberg prosecutors. These are the guys who were there with Justice Jackson at Nuremberg, 1945 to 1946, who saw the process unfold, who could see firsthand the, uh, in, in the machinations among the various uh, defendants, the defendants' attorneys, how it really played out, uh, and also many of the folks who interviewed the folks that we see on History Channel, the Gehrings, the Hesses, the Ribbentrops, uh, they're all here. Uh, and have had a chance to spend some time with them, quality time within the last couple of days, and I think those who come and listen to them today uh, through the radio station or come to the uh, Robert Jackson Center, which they're welcome to do this morning at 10.30, we're going to start. Uh, I think they're going to be exceedingly, exceedingly pleased to see the quality and caliber of these po people and the passion they have for Robert Jackson. Well, Greg Peterson, as we know, right now, C-SPAN, of course, is here to record that conversation 
and uh, we will have an opportunity when they schedule it to see it uh, in its entirety. Well, we're very excited that we had an opportunity to talk to the folks in Washington, and uh, we sent down what it is that we're trying to accomplish, and they were very thrilled about it and said, show us the final product, and uh, we hopefully we'll be able to play it soon. Well, thanks to you, thanks to Randy, thanks to everybody. We hope this microphone is going to have as much opportunity as possible to be with those gentlemen this morning and give the audience a chance to meet each and every one of them. Well, and also, in addition to the prosecutors, we have the grandchildren of Robert Jackson who heard about this event and made a special effort, an extraordinary effort, to come up from the Washington, D.C. area just to be here to uh, meet and greet those folks who work with their grandfather at Nuremberg uh, and to kind of capture the essence of what's going on here at the Robert Jackson Center. We couldn't be happier. Well, Greg Peterson, do you sense at this time in our history, just at this particular moment, what we're going through, just what this international law now means to the world? I don't. Th one of the nice things is when we started the concept of the Robert Jackson Center with Carl Kapp and Betty Lene and Dan Bratton and all the wonderful people who uh, kind of collaborated at the same time uh, with this concept, we had no idea the r real relevance that would occur just within a one-year period. Slobodan Milosevic gets arrested, turned over to the Hague Court. Uh, how, what are the principles of which he will be tried? Well, the Nuremberg Principles. Where did the Nuremberg Principles come from? Robert Jackson. And here we have uh, the extraordinary events that occurred September 11th, uh, the tragic events that occurred September 11th. And if, in fact, they ever capture bin Laden, uh, he will be put on trial. And what are the principles of which he will be tried? Crimes against humanity. That's a term that started back at the Nuremberg trials. And who was that? Robert Jackson. So uh, when you reflect back, Jim, on a guy f who was born in Spring Creek Township, Pennsylvania, Frewsburg, Jamestown, never went to college, one year of law school, and ultimately ended up being the chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials, which is now today are the principles of which uh, Milosevic and bin Laden, if arrested, would be tried. That's unbelievable. Opening remarks by yes. Greg Peterson. Uh, during that broadcast, Russ. This is the times of your life and the times of Robert Jackson's life. You know, Jim, going back to that passage that you read, uh, that, could be, that could be published for today, couldn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. What a remarkable mind he had. Just the word, how often are we hearing the word evil today? Yes, that's right. There are so many uh, opportunities to talk about um, the historic times now yes. mm -hmm. be, uh, due to the wonderful uh, contribution made by Betty Lene and Carl oh, Kappa yes. and others yeah. to, to have what will eventually be after uh, the work is completed a, a beautiful as uh, one wanted to call it a learning center too That's right, yeah. for Robert H. Jackson <laughs> John Barrett is a graduate of Georgetown and the Harvard Law School, a professor of law at St. John's University in New York, and he is editing Justice Robert Jackson's memoir of President Franklin D. Roosevelt and writing a biographical account of Jackson year as the prosecutor. Professor Barrett, <laughs> I'm in your classroom today. Well, good morning, Jim. I, I'm actually in the classroom of these three great former Nuremberg prosecutors who will be speaking at the Jackson Center this morning. John Barrett, Professor Barrett, you're a very young man. You weren't even born, I, I believe, during those years. No, I, I was born later. I'm, I just turned 40, so I, I missed the Jackson era in, in the calendar sense, but I think we all live in the Jackson era in the legal and historical sense. What, what motivated you to, to head in that direction? Well, I think as, as any lawyer begins to study law and read Supreme Court opinions, the words of Robert Jackson leap, leap off the page. He was the most beautiful, powerful writer to serve on the Supreme Court in the 20th century, maybe ever. And then as, as you learn about his career and the various things he did in the Roosevelt administration, on the court, at Nuremberg, uh, he, he was just a giant. And that, that got me started in, in research and writing about him. In your research, Professor Barrett, did you find that he loved being called the country lawyer. Oh, he was a son of, of this area and always retained those ties and that outlook and that attitude. He, 
he was a, a trial lawyer, uh, a real soup to nuts general practitioner for about 20 years here in, in Jamestown and in Chautauqua County. And I think he always uh, cherished those experiences and thought of himself very much as the country lawyer. The, the debate over how to put the law, the international law, in place to try these war criminals there there wasn't a full agreement among the nations oh no actually what jackson uh, accomplished at nuremberg began with really quite a tussle among the allies i mean what to do following the war with the vanquished nazis and many people including stalin and churchill and senior officials in the roosevelt administration believed that the right thing to do was simply line up a whole bunch of them and shoot them um, which is what a victor has the power to do to a vanquished enemy. Uh, what Jackson stood for, what he articulated, and what President Truman ap appointed him to do at Nuremberg was something that exercised restraint, that applied principle and law, and that began to build a, sy a system of international law to hold people accountable in a fair process, based on proof, based on a determination of guilt, based on a proportional assessment of individual responsibility. Wasn't there that temptation in him as it was in Stalin and in Churchill to, uh, to, you know, have that anger and say, we don't have to go to court. These gentlemen should be executed as soon as possible. Well, I, I think in any situation of dispute, uh, a person's natural reaction is anger. In a situation of war, the ultimate dispute, and a war as destructive as World War II, um, you know, rage, outrage is the natural reaction. And remember that at Nuremberg, Jackson was working in a city that was a pile of rubble, one of the great historic centers of culture, art, architecture, and European history, had been obliterated in the last year of the war. Um, and, and Jackson certainly had to process and balance all those human emotions with the call of the law and the responsibility as a lawyer. Where, where did you start your research? Well, I began actually with Justice Jackson's papers in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., which are an amazing collection donated by his children, which show his hands-on work and so many pages in his own pen, the, the gorgeous blue ink from his fountain pen on page after page of yellow legal paper. Um, and from there, from the, the words and the, and the documents, I quickly came, came up here and, and realized that I had to understand where he sprang from and the connections and the work uh, that was part of his formative period. And, uh, you know, from there I've ranged widely. Well, I would assume you've read Eugene Gerhardt's book called The American Advocate. Yes, I have. That's, that is the one biography of, of Robert Jackson that's in print. And Mr. Gerhardt worked on that for quite a few years had a number of interviews with Justice Jackson in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and really captures much of the career and the personality of Jackson. So I know that book well. Professor Barrett, if you'll stand by, I want to ask you a particular question. We'll be back after these messages. You said I'm in Professor Barrett's classroom this morning, but this young man is working on a book regarding Justice Robert H. Jackson. Uh, are you dealing just with him uh, or with his association with the Nuremberg trial? Well, I'm focusing on Jackson at Nuremberg, so obviously the setting is important, but my, my interest is really the man and his, his thinking, his, his immediate day-to-day -day experience, um, which really does touch into all other parts of his, his biography. You have to understand where he came from before you can understand him at Nuremberg. Let me ask you this, Professor Barrett. What cases have you read that he handled when he was a country lawyer? Well, I was actually reading uh, a case just the other evening. Uh, one of the local ju judges uh, actually has been great and pulled a case file. It's a case about runoff from the sewer system of Jamestown, uh, which contaminated some streams, which were consumed by some cows uh, who died of disease. And Jackson represented the cow owners uh, suing the municipality. This case had to be tried twice. Uh, it was a big fight about the medical issues of cow infection. Uh, Jackson won the case twice. The first time it was vacated on appeal and they had to go back and do it over again. And at the end of the whole process, he'd won a very tough case and he'd so impressed the city, his adversary, that they quickly hired him to take over all the municipal legal work. So cows to city government issues uh, are just two pieces that that one case shows Jackson dealt with. Where was the first opportunity for Franklin Roosevelt to see the genius of this man? 
Well, they first met in Albany when Roosevelt was a first-term state senator and Robert Jackson was a law student at Albany Law School for a brief year where he crammed in two years of coursework. I think it was probably a handshake and not much more. Uh, but then when Roosevelt was assistant secretary of the Navy in the Wilson administration, Jackson and his mentor and distant relative, Frank Mott, a local attorney, would travel down to Washington as Democratic county officials on behalf of various prospective candidates to be the postmaster of Chautauqua County. And the person they knew in Washington was this former state senator, Frank Roosevelt. And so they would show up at his door and they had a number of meetings and Roosevelt would kind of point them in the right direction as they navigated their way around Washington. So it goes back to the teens. Let me ask where the moment arrived that he was going to be considered for the Supreme Court. Well, I think this was um, a meteor who, who caught the eye of Franklin Roosevelt really very shortly after Jackson joined the New Deal in Washington in 1934. And uh, it, it was six years later that Roosevelt actually put him on the Supreme Court, but uh, the idea and, and really a lot of press discussion of it was there, uh, you know, by 1936, 1937. Um, Roosevelt puts him on the court in 1941, and, and I believe Roosevelt always intended to make him Chief Justice uh, when the next opening in the center chair occurred. Uh, unfortunately for, for that scenario, Roosevelt passed away too soon. Wasn't Harlan Stone the other figure? Right. Well, Stone was actually a, a Republican appointee, a Her Herbert Hoover appointee to the Supreme Court, and Roosevelt made him Chief Justice in 1941 in, in the interest of national unity. But uh, Justice Stone was no spring chicken and, and not a very fit fellow. And I, I think Roosevelt understood that he would be a short-termer and then young Robert Jackson would be the successor. Well, Professor Barrett, I'd love to spend more time, but we are certainly going to give time to other personalities here for this historic moment. So thank you so much. We'll see you in the cafeteria. Meet members of the family, the granddaughters here. Uh, and uh, I want to introduce Julia Craighill. Let me say thank you for this special moment. Well, we are just thrilled and excited to be here. This is an exciting event and uh, a wonderful center that's going to be opening uh, soon. What, what is your first memory of your, of your grandfather? Well, I'm actually so young that I never met him. I was born three years after he died, but uh, certainly his presence and uh, life has been very real and vivid to me through my, my mother, who was his daughter. What, uh, what stories did she tell you about this, this man? Well, she uh, told us a lot about their uh, early years that they spent uh, horseback riding. Uh, he would come back on the summers, and they would camp uh, on the hillside of Jackson Hill in Spring Creek, Pennsylvania. And we uh, later came back and built a cabin in Spring Creek. Um, and I've summered there the past 20 years. Uh, so we're very close to this whole area. Well, nice of you to be thinking of us and coming back to enjoy it. And of course, it's in memory of uh, your grandfather. But, you know, we heard about his love of horses. I heard it through his sister, Helen Adams, when they had the opportunity to interview her. It's a wonderful story. But he was able to combine living the kind of simple life he wanted with the prestigious position he held. Oh, absolutely. He loved to come and camp on the hillside with my mother. All their, their transport was entirely horses. They would actually ride from Jamestown to Spring Creek, a two-day ride, spending the night in the stable at Sugar Grove, you know, sleeping with the horses, uh, and then he'd get up and make pancakes over the fire and, uh, and just be outdoors you know, camping. Do you, uh, do you say wow when you realize he was the... Chief Rutz uh, conducted the Nuremberg trial? I think that his enormous accomplishments are something I've always grown up with, um, but I've, I've just always been in, in awe, really, of him and, and all he accomplished. Have you read a lot of his decisions? Um, I have. I've, I've chosen another uh, profession to go into, um, unlike a lot, my brother who is here and a lot of the family who went into the law, but he was a, a wonderful writer. You know, even someone not in the law like myself can appreciate. Well, Professor Barrett said he, he had the, he was brilliant at making the, uh, you know, the decisions very simple, direct, concise, but yet, what they should be. Yes. Well, there are phrases that have been used, you know, yesterday. He made, he was a, a wordsmith that could create these immortal phrases. 
and we're fortunate to have him for the rest of our lives. What a, you must stand proud of the legacy he's left and what this occasion today means. Uh, this, is, this has been a very exciting um, uh, event. I called my father to tell him all about it, and, and the family is just thrilled. Have you uh, obviously you've driven by the statue at uh, at the Samuel G. Love School? Mm -hmm. That's it's beautiful and really speaks to you know he's beckoning people in to become educated. He was self-educated, but read and notated books. We have these where he writes in the margins and and just voracious learner his whole life. We try today to tell people to spend 15 minutes with their children. <laughs> <laughs> and he probably spent 15 hours a day. Oh, yeah. He was very dedicated to his, his kids and uh, to learning. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Let me meet your brother here, Tom Loftus. Oh. Welcome to our town. Good morning. I'm sure you've been here before. I have uh, at various times, and, uh, but this is, uh, this is dramatic. It's a wonderful development. It's just the kind of thing uh, our family uh, perhaps would hope for. What, uh, I mean, just how do you, you know, look at it, saying, you know, this, this man conducted the most famous trial in history. And, um, you know, the, the, the horrible crimes that were committed during World War II were put before this court. These criminals were given a chance to be judged by the law. Uh, it was a, a wonderful opportunity to advance international law and to try to replace the, uh, the ethic of, of uh, just international conflict and war uh, with a more prudent, reasonable approach to deciding uh, disputes between nations. Um, and it was a wonderful opportunity to document the uh, uh, horrors of the Holocaust and of the Nazis uh, so that there could be no doubt what happened and who was responsible. The evidence that they gathered, he wanted to be, he wanted it to be hard evidence, evidence that could be believed, evidence that was legitimate, uh, you know, with the others, as we said earlier to with Professor Barrett, the other nations wanted a quick execution in a sense. I think, I think so. That had been the tradition. Uh, but uh, I think at some point uh, the international community uh, will be well advised to move beyond uh, simply a concept of war and prisoners of war and uh, uh, move to uh, a more judicious, shall we say, uh, approach in their relationships. So this is part of it. Well, in this state we're in today, Mr. Loftus, right here, with a war criminal, <laughs> with one that's already in prison, Slobodan Milosevic, the, the principles of the uh, Nuremberg trial would apply. This will continue, and it uh, hopefully is a deterrent to uh, people who would seize power and uh, use it uh, corruptly, uh, improperly, uh, that there will be consequences for them personally. And Nuremberg uh, established that precedent. Are, is there a favorite uh, you know, sentence, a favorite uh, piece of uh, uh, you know, oratory that you enjoy and read over and over again from, from Robert Jackson? Well, uh, as a lawyer, I think you would look at it again and again. There are enough that uh, I, I don't necessarily concentrate on one. Uh, in my work, uh, I try to advise the commissioners of a, a federal agency how to resolve disputes, and I find that in going back to Supreme Court decisions that set out the principles, uh, quite often, it turns out to be my grandfather's writing, and uh, his, his writing, his, his comprehensive and clear approach, created uh, many landmark decisions. Well, we heard about the early, <laughs> we heard about the early one from Professor Barrett uh, on, on just a local situation, but, uh, you know, the rest is history. We're, we're delighted to have this opportunity to meet you. Oh, thank you very much. It's just uh, a, a wonderful day for the family. And we're looking forward to the historic moment there in the Kappa Theater. But this gentleman, how old were you, Harold Adams, when you were in Nuremberg? I was 19. Uh, a mere, mere lad. Uh, and I was in the Army at the time. Uh, and the I was ready to ask what 
you know, what reason were you there when you realized, uh, of course, uh, uh, your, I should, I want to appropriately give you the title. <laughs> well, I was a PFC in the 1st uh, Infantry d Division, and uh, so uh, I uh, really wasn't aware that the trial was uh, concluding when it was, but uh, anyway, uh, I was summoned to the uh, CO's office, and he said, uh, I don't know who you know, but uh, you're ordered to Nuremberg uh, immediately. So <laughs> that's how I uh, happened to get down there. Well, you should tell, of course, that Helen Adams is. Oh, yes. Uh, my mother was uh, uh, Robert's uh, little sister. War crimes of the European theater to me, and that is the way that I got uh, to Europe. And, uh, uh, and I met uh, Justice Jackson and his staff, and I uh, was invited to join them in August 1945. And I served uh, uh, on the, uh, the staff until the conclusion of the trial in October 1945. At the time, was it apparent to you what history was being made? Oh, well, it was, uh, 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 yes, it was uh, significant, uh, particularly as the trial went forward. And it's the work that are all at Nuremberg, that it's something that we treasure and that we engaged in uh, with a great deal of satisfaction and a great deal of feeling of accomplishment. Today, what America is going through and what the world is witnessing, the evil that is existing today, will be will international law be the answer to you know and committing i mean getting the punishment you deserve for the crime well, we think that uh, that uh, we have stepped forward now with the uh, uh, adoption of the rome statute creating an international criminal court that uh, that court of course is not yet in existence because it must be ratified by 60 nations but when that court does uh, come into existence then we will have a permanent tribunal in place so that uh, should a trial uh, have to take place as uh, the Nuremberg case did, it will not be before an ad hoc tribunal uh, of judges that, uh, created uh, or uh, who uh, established uh, for that particular trial, but it will be in a, a pre-existing court. And uh, that is uh, uh, trying to advance and to further Justice Jackson's dream of uh, a world uh, let me just uh, say here that I opened the show by uh, quoting here that he was a country lawyer in an international court. Was he a country lawyer? Well, he was, <clears throat> he was a country lawyer in the sense that he respected the law and he grew up in the country, but he was an extraordinary lawyer for either the country or the city. So that we're talking about his roots, but his, he developed into one of the great Supreme Court justices to be compared to, with Holmes and other great figures. And he had a marvelous gift of expression, and he was a lot clearer than Holmes. You always knew what the case was about when you read one of his opinions, and you always, almost always, came away with a great statement that and Casper summarized the core of the case. You feel the same way? Oh, yes, well, one might say, for instance, that he was a man for all seasons and a man for all areas and of the world. And that should, there should be, since there is only one world, there should be ultimately a court with authority over the whole world. Gentlemen, I can only thank you sincerely for this honor to be with you here at the Castle Theater and uh, the wonderful day that's going to pay tribute here to Robert Jackson. Oh, you're very right. uh, uh, pleased to be here, sir. Thank you. We, thank you. we are indeed. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Sir. And together prosecuted the case beginning in November 1945 and concluding nine months later at the end of the summer of 1946. This proceeding is known as the International Military Tribunal, or IMT, which is an acronym you may hear in our discussion today. It concluded 
and sentences were imposed and executions occurred in October 1946, Justice Jackson at that point finished his Nuremberg work and returned to Washington and to his Supreme, his Supreme Court seat, which he'd been AWOL from for the previous year. The work at Nuremberg, however, continued by an American prosecution effort. And there were subsequent trials, known as the subsequent proceedings, that were no longer international. They were American prosecutions. And there were a series of important trials over the next few years. Those proceedings were headed by the American Chief Lawyer General Telford Taylor. And so in today's discussion, you will hear about the IMT, State of Washington. He was a graduate, an undergraduate degree from the University of Washington, and then a law degree from Bolt Hall at the University of California, Berkeley. Mr. Harris, in the 1930s, began to practice law in Los Angeles and was doing so up through December 7, 1941, when the world changed. After Pearl Harbor, Mr. Harris enlisted in the Navy. He spent years serving our country in the Navy, and then, toward the end of the war, was transferred to the OSS uh, to be a spy or an operative, uh, or as he referred to it in passing yesterday in his very modest way, they trained us to fight with knives and things. Uh, <laughs> Whitney Harris in the OSS, the precursor, of course, to today's CIA, and would that today's CIA did the work as well as that day's OSS appeared to, uh, Mr. Harris was sent to London. And his assignment was to begin to gather evidence for the OSS for the prosecution of war criminals. In London, as Whitney Harris is doing this work, arrives Robert Jackson on the Truman assignment and the work of what becomes the London Conference culminating in the London Agreement. And Mr. Harris becomes affiliated, uh, first informally, later formally, with the Jackson operation. And through his, his talent and his work there, he's asked to accompany the Jackson project to Nuremberg and join the prosecution. At Nuremberg, Mr. Harris assembled the cases, the evidence, against the Gestapo, the SS, and against an individual defendant named Ernst Kaltenbrunner, who was the chief, the chief of the Reich Main Security Office. Mr. Harris also at Nuremberg undertook a series of special assignments for Justice Jackson, and it's fair to say that Mr. Harris was uh, a member of the near circle, perhaps the very inner circle, of the Jackson Project. On January 2, 1946, Mr. Harris walked to the microphone at the podium you see in the photo display uh, and addressed the tribunal. He was a trial lawyer in that proceeding and he presented the evidence against defendant Colton Bruner. Mr. Harris was at Nuremberg through the verdict and the executions in October 1946. He then moved to Berlin, continuing to serve our country on the staff of General Lucius Clay, and was there for really what we now recognize as the start of the Cold War, the Berlin blockade, the Berlin airlift, and the momentous efforts there. So he rose from its broad shoulders. He was a graduate of the University of Meltzer, worked for two years as the executive assistant to Jerome Frank, who was the chairman of the, of the Securities and Exchange Commission, a great legal thinker and writer, later a federal appellate judge on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. One tidbit that I will mention is that although Meltzer worked for Frank and the place was called the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Robert Jackson archives at the Library of Congress contain a very interesting memo. September 1938, written, uh, 1939, written by Meltzer to Jerome Frank concerning the war. Now, I think that the talent and the great minds of the New Deal went to the real projects. And that alone is interesting. What are securities lawyers doing analyzing war powers in 1939? But they knew what was coming and, and obviously had a serious issue and a serious lawyer did a great analysis. The next step that's interesting is the cover memo, which is from Jerome Frank to Bob Jackson, who was Solicitor General of the United States. And it's a short memo that says, Bob, you should take a look at this. It's a good piece of work, Jerry. Um, and so in, in that very early way as a matter of legal work product, and he began at that point to seek to enlist in the military service. Uh, you notice his glasses, and it took our country a couple of years to let Bernie be a soldier. So in the meantime, he became a special assistant to S Assistant Secretary of State Dean Acheson, and he became the acting chief of the Foreign Funds Control Division. In 1943, Professor Meltzer was finally uh, an officer admitted to the U.S. Navy. He first served in Europe. He, too, became affiliated with the OSS, and he was supposed to go to China to contribute to its efforts in the Asian theater. 
He got as far as San Francisco in 1945, where he was present for the creation of the United Nations, and then through a call from a former supervisor and senior lawyer and Department of Justice official, was asked to go to Nuremberg. And so he takes a right turn and, and heads east again, and is brought there to be part of this project. At Nuremberg, Mr. Meltzer worked on the economic case, which was the gathering and presentation of evidence against the German industrialists and bankers, the economic power behind the Third Reich. And on January 11th, 1946, nine days after Whitney Harris, Bernie Meltzer walked to the podium, stood at the microphone, and addressed the, tri the tribunal in that momentous case. Bernie presented the evidence against Walter Funk, who headed Hitler's ministry of Propaganda and Enlightenment, which is quite a bureaucratic title, and was present at Nuremberg and assisted in the work of the Jackson American Prosecution Team through the summer of 1946. Mr. Meltzer, too, left Nuremberg after the IMT case and following that finally got back to Chicago to begin the rest of his life. He returned to his alma mater at the University of Chicago, became a law professor, rose in its rank to be one of the stars of its faculty, to occupy the Edward H. Levy Distinguished Professor of Law Chair on the faculty, and although he continued to write, teach to be part of that staff. Uh, Professor King arrived in Nuremberg when the IMT trial was in progress during early 1946, and at Nuremberg he first assisted with the work on that case and the preparations for what became the subsequent proceedings. As part of the preparation, following the convictions of principal defendants in the IMT trial, Professor King interrogated a number of the defendants. Among the people he interrogated were Hermann Goering, the former head of the Luftwaffe and Hitler's former number two, and Albert Speer, who was Hitler's architect and friend and the former Minister of Armaments in the Third Reich. Speer, uh, in Mr. King's perception, and I think in fact, was a much more interesting character than Hermann Goering, and Henry King developed what I think it's fair to call a relationship, and perhaps he even used the word friendship, with Albert Speer. Albert Speer was convicted but not given a capital sentence at Nuremberg, and so he was sent to the Spandau prison where he served a 20-year sentence. Henry King maintained and resumed contact with Speer when he was released from Spandau in the early 1960s, and Speer became a topic of King's important writing in this area. Now, I will step back to Nuremberg and the subsequent proceedings. Mr. King's role was to work after the IMT case on a range of important matters. He was a trial prosecutor in the case against Erhard Milch, who was Goering's deputy in the Luftwaffe. And so he, too, was a Nuremberg trial lawyer in the continuation of the effort uh, following the, the Allied departure and the American continuation in the subsequent proceedings. Following Nuremberg, Mr. King began a legal career that included a very private and in-house corporate law practice. For many years, he was counsel to what is today the TRW Corporation and had really global responsibilities on a, a huge range of corporate legal problems for that and other clients. He is settled and is currently a residence in Cleveland, Ohio, and in addition to his law practice, he too, like former Professor Harris and current Professor Meltzer, followed the path to teaching in academia becoming a professor of law at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Mr. King is known as an expert and teaches in the field of international law, the international issues that were obviously an issue at Nuremberg, and also a much broader range of issues. He is a co-chair of a U.S.-Canadian Law Institute and an expert on those transborder issues uh, in addition to war crimes and the things we're going to talk about. He knows an immense amount about international air and water and fishing and resource law and the things that really make for peaceful coexistence among nations. He is a prolific writer and a powerful speaker. His work on Speer has culminated in a wonderful book called The Two Worlds of Albert Speer, which evaluates the Nazi and the humane, intelligent, attractive man that Speer was and tries to figure out how those could coexist. Uh, and that, too, is a wonderful piece of work. It's a pleasure to welcome Henry King to Jamestown. Our fourth guest on my far left is Mr. James Conway. Mr. Conway is a lifelong New Yorker, born 1911 in New York City. He is a graduate of Fordham University, Fordham Law School, and has a graduate law degree from New York University. 
After his military service in World War II, Mr. Conway, seeking action and more relevant things to do with his legal abilities, I believe, applied to and was selected to join the legal staff in Nuremberg. He too arrived in the spring of 1946 while the IMT proceedings, the trial was underway, and he got to observe Justice Jackson in the courtroom during that time as he too worked to assemble evidence and to prepare for what became the subsequent proceedings. Mr. Conway worked on preparing the cases in the subsequent proceedings, including the case that was brought against Earhart Milch, the case that Henry King prosecuted, Goering's deputy. Mr. Conway also had an interesting uh, piece of Nuremberg work, which occurred in Washington. He was sent from Nuremberg to the Pentagon to retrieve much of the evidence that had been developed and assembled by officers. Uh, and so they sent the evidence home really a bit too early. And so Jim Conway is sent to retrieve uh, and to dig and to be a bit of an archaeologist and pulls back to Nuremberg evidence that's used in the subsequent proceedings. After his work at Nuremberg, Mr. Conway returned to New York City and to law practice there. He led his own firm, Conway, Farrell, Curtin, and Kelly, for many years and has had a distinguished career practicing insurance law and among many other areas.